So why and how are the Democrats using the boogeyman, as you called it, of Russian collusion to delegitimize Donald Trump? Yeah. Well, behind the whole Russian collusion story is a, a, a fact that if you look at local offices, state governors, uh, the governorship, state legislatures, the House, the Senate, the presidency, the Supreme Court, all the reins of power are out of democratic hands. It's been destroyed as a party by Barack Obama. He created a paradigm of ginning up minority identity politics support and alienating the working classes that was not transferable. Hillary got the downside of alienating but not the upside of the minority support. And it, under his reign of eight years, the Democratic Party imploded. That's, and they're angry about that. And they look at Hillary Clinton, they can't believe that she blew this, what should have been an easy victory, they think. And in response to that, they have to explain it. And Hillary said Comey did it, she was a woman, but she also said the Russians did. Now, we have to be empirical. The Russians always throw gears in our election. Uh, but I mean, Bill Clinton spoke for a million plus dollars to very various Russian avenues. Hillary Clinton did things at Secretary of State that were very dubious, like allowing our, a quarter of uranium um, assets of North America to go into Russian hands. But I think the Russians, for them, that if Flynn or Paul Manafort, whoever they were, had Russian contacts that were commiserate or similar to those in the Democratic Party. They made that into something. And yet, we know that he was surveilled. We know that James Clapper, the head of the intelligence agency, said there, were no, there was no evidence of collusion. We know that the FBI uh, paid money to have research that was completely bogus, even by uh, the Democratic Party realizes that Trump did not go to a hotel room and engage in sexual deviancy with Putin operatives. So this serves an, a psychological need, but also it, the idea is if you keep saying it enough, the big lie, then you weaken his public approval ratings, you weaken his public approval ratings, you peel off Congress people, senators that don't want to be associated with him. And then finally, there is evidence, uh, and we know there's evidence, that people in the Obama administration surveilled people surrounding Trump, and those names were on mask, perhaps by Susan Rice, perhaps by John Brennan, perhaps by James Comey. We don't know who they were. At best, that was unethical, but if it was reverse targeted, in other words, they didn't just uh, surveil Russian operatives who happened to, in that net, bring up Americans, but rather they used that as an excuse to go after people in the Trump campaign, or they colluded with people in Britain or Estonia or somewhere to bring that in. Uh, information so they could unmask it and leak it. And we know they leaked because that came up during the campaign. That's that's the real scandal. And by saying Trump colluded, Trump colluded, Trump colluded, then we as we directed our attention away from the real story. And that was very effective with James Comey because he kept saying in testimony, "We're investigating collusion," but he would never answer whether he was investigating the unmasking, which I think is a much more uh, uh, potentially damaging story. Well, I think three people were impediments to finding out what really happened with the Obama administration and the use of the intelligence agencies to not only surveil, but to leak that information to pet journalists. And they were James Comey, uh, James Clapper, and John Brennan, the head of the CIA, director of national intelligence and the FBI, and they're all gone now. And to me, that's sort of like a dam on a river that's that's broken, and uh, now there are not people invested in their careers or in the Obama administration that will that will protect uh, sources and will will deter people from coming forward. So I think that we'll see start things that will start to trickle out. We've already seen it in the case of Susan Rice. We know that she unmasked people. She would not testify about it. And I think now that these people are gone out of the Intelligence Committee, people will come up within the Intelligence Committee and say, you know what, what we did was wrong. And I think we'll see things in the next six months that are quite surprising.
So talk about the political and cultural resistance to Trump and almost the Trump derangement syndrome that we're seeing. What are the what's at stake if the Democrats and the left are so uncivil that they can't accept a new government? It's a good question because it's a two part answer, I suppose. One is what caused that derangement syndrome? and what are the ramifications of it. What caused it, I think, is almost a class bias. You see a little bit of it with the never Trump on the Republican side. And they look at Trump and they see, see, wow, his appearance, his personal life, his Queen's accent, his taste, his gaudiness. It just doesn't fit the Washington, New, New York, understated, privileged, elite value system. The way he talks, the way he acts, he hangs out with wrestling people. He. Uh, he likes Mike Tyson. He, he's just uncouth. And so a lot of the anger and furor against him was, I think, class-driven. Because if you actually look at his positions or his prior political life, which had been kind of left and center, there was no reason to incur that hostility. The other thing is, where does it lead? And I think the Democrats have a problem. That is that the ruling class of the party is geriatric in the sense that Nancy Pelosi is 79. I mean, I'm 63, so I have nothing against old age. Diane Feinstein's 83. Jerry Brown, I think, almost 80. Steny Hoyer's 77. Um, so you've got people who are from a different generation. And the new, younger generation are, in some ways, unhinged. Uh, Perez at the, D at the DNC and Keith Ellison, they're not a corrective for that. So they're in search of an identity. and their reaction to the loss of 2016, if they were sober, would have been, we, our blue wall crumbled. And that's because we didn't visit those states enough, we didn't appeal to pay book issues, and we, we talked so much about white privilege among the elite, we didn't realize that the people who had white privilege are elite and are left wing usually, but the people who didn't have it, we castigated and called irredeemable or deplorable, and Obama had called them clingers and we have to win those people back. And so it, it reminds me of 1968 when Humphrey came close and the obvious remedy for his defeat in 72 would have been to say, you know, you can't have a George Wallace come in and steal the working class vote that lost you the election in 68. You cannot have uh, a Chicago convention riot on the screen where the Democratic Party is being torn apart by the left. You've got to get back to centrist issues like JFK or something. Instead, they reacted the other way. We weren't hard left enough. We have the Voting Act of 1971. We have the 18-year vote, and so they nominated George McGovern. So I see something like that, where Hillary, they should have said, Hillary won the popular vote. We would have won those key states had we visited them and, and stressed economic issues. And now the answer is, we didn't have enough Black Lives Matter transgendered issue, climate change. I think they're going to end up like they did in 72. Let's talk about the best things about Donald Trump and the aspects about his governance that worry you. I know you worded that question very carefully about his governance, governance that worried me rather than his character. So I'll, I'll stick to your question. Uh, I think he's unpredictable and he's not shackled by traditional political uh, restrictions. So he can say anything to anyone at any time. That's supposed to be volatile, but actually unpredictability both in deal making, as he knows better than we do from the Manhattan real estate arena, is a plus. And he's using that to his advantage overseas. So what I see for the first 100 days is an, a dangerous effort, but an effort nevertheless to restore deterrence. So he's trying to remind Iran or China or Russia the Middle East and General Korea, that the last eight years were an aberration. And it would have led to an escalating provocative stance by st states that are weaker than we are. And they had, in an aberrant fashion, convinced themselves that they were not weaker. So what he's trying to say is, the United States is a enforcer of world norms. Please don't be provocative anymore because it's going to end up badly for you. And losing deterrence under Obama was dangerous, and restoring it under Trump will be dangerous. But eventually, like Reagan's corrective to Carter, we'll be okay. I think domestically, there's a lot of hysteria, but I think we had gone so far on the progressive trajectory that we forgot what the normal 
center was in American politics. So Trump comes back and says, they approved the wall years ago, it was funded, I'm just going to finish it. Uh, Dakota, Keystone were approved, the EPA tried to stop it, but even Hillary Clinton's State Department had no environmental objections. The tax reform is basically going not back to even Reagan's, but back to George W. Bush's rates. So what you guys consider revolutionary is only revolutionary because you're revolutionaries. But I'm going back to the center, the Clinton-Bush center. And, you, and then we get to the point, well, why is it so hysterical? Because the Democratic Party is really being led. It doesn't exist as a party of ideas. I mean, Hillary ran on the, on the premise that she wasn't Donald Trump the monster and she was a woman, but she didn't have an agenda of issues because the LGBT issue or the global change, climate change issue or the identity politics, black lives, these were media-driven phenomena. They were not thought up by local uh, assemblymen or state senators in the Democratic Party. They were, came from down on high by the media, and that's what drives the Democratic Party. So in some sense, Steve Bannon was correct when he said there's the Republicans and then there's the media as the oppositional party. Other than that, I think Trump has done pretty well. It would be easy and, and maybe cheap to say he shouldn't Twitter or he should be less uncouth, but you get the impression that the downside of that is outweighed by the upside. Of people were so starved for being candidness and, and candor and bluntness. So that I think he's done pretty well so far, but it's, it's very hard to, to restore deterrence and get politics back to the center. Um, to what extent was the Trump victory on election night a repudiation of Obama's policies? Yes. Well, Trump was a repudiation of Obama. We, we forget one thing that until January of 2016, the cumulative positive approval ratings of Obama had been dismal, one of the lowest in, in record, much lower than George Bush until his last year. And then Obama wised up and thought, the less I'm seen and the less I'm heard, the more popular I am. So he hit the golf course, he just stayed away and let the Republican and Democratic primaries divert attention and made him look in comparison quiet and calm and charismatic. But that didn't hide the fact that uh, if we would look empirically at his issues, they, they were, he was the first president in history that never in eight years achieved 2% economic growth. And that meant that thousands of people in real terms of family income, I should say millions of people became poor. Uh, if you look at the lead from behind uh, foreign policy, he left the Middle East by the withdrawal from Iraq, the Iran deal, the bombing and then skidoo from Libya, the Syria red lines, he left it a mess. The reset failed with Russia. China built a military base in the Spratly Islands. So they, it wasn't an impress it was a d dismal foreign policy record. He doubled the debt. We, we owe $20 trillion. He did, no president uh, had quite done that. George Bush almost did it, but he doubled the debt and left us uh, in a no-win situation where after eight years of zero interest rates, which really stagnated the economy, what do we do now? We go back to normal interest rates and we double the cost of financing this huge debt. So he, I, I compared him once to Stanley Baldwin who knew that if he could just get out of town okay without a war or depression, he was a success. But he he did, he did things that are not going to be popular. And then finally, his post-presidency is eerily reminiscent so far of the Clintons. He, after saying you didn't build that, it's not the time to profit, you made enough money, he's now adopting the Clinton model of a foundation, the Clinton model of a library, the Clinton model of Wall Street $400,000 lectures, the Clinton model of staying in Washington, the Clinton model of having a mansion in Washington, the Clinton model of wink and nod that my wife might also have a political career in the way that Bill did with, with Hillary that leveraged what should have been a retirement into a second career. And so that's, that, that didn't work for Clinton because he was a, a liberal, but it surely doesn't work for a progressive to have that sort of elitist cash-in attitude about a post-presidency. Is there anything that ordinary citizens can do about the increasing 
um, level of incivility and intolerance and our abil our, we're losing free speech, what can we do? It's hard for individual citizens, especially in a country of 330 million, but <clears throat> I think what a lot of us do, we kind of live in monasteries of the mind. In other words, when things bother us and we feel that they're not subject to political correction, at least very quickly, we tune out and drop out. And sometimes that has an effect. If people look at the University of Missouri that went off the rails and really violated free speech and intimidated people, their, their admissions are down 20 percent and they're in financial catastrophe because donors stopped doing it. If, for example, at Claremont or Middlebury, people said, you know what, I'm not going to send my child there and I, I don't want to give money to that institution, it would have an enormous effect. Look at, I think some of us who watch sports realize about five years ago, we didn't want to get a lecture from a jock about how politically incorrect we were when we just wanted to have a football play analyzed. And yet that's what ESPN had become. And so what happened, we turned out, we don't watch it, and ESPN is in real trouble. And so uh, I think that's what people can do. I don't think, I don't believe in organized boycotts, but I do believe that you just have to concentrate on what's positive in your life and these things that are bothersome, you just don't participate in. And I don't, I used to love to go to the movies. Hollywood for me now either makes a bad remake of a work of genius in the 1950s, or I, I go to Hollywood and I usually find out that there's a race, class, gender agenda, and that some person in, in those categories is fighting an evil corporation or the United States. And I always think to myself, these are produced filmed, written, and acted by products of the corporate system who are all fa fabulously wealthy, and yet they're saying that people like me are somehow culpable. I don't want to watch it, so I would rather stay home and watch a good movie on Turner Classic Movies. I don't go to the, I don't go to the movies. I don't watch ESPN. I don't give any money to the University of California, Santa Cruz, where I got my undergraduate degree or my graduate degree at Stanford University because I just feel that I work there, but I don't feel I'm a part of the university community. They have values that I don't share. But I don't want to be vocal and obnoxious and lecture them the way they sermonize other people. So I think there's a lot of Americans like that. That's what this election was about. All the polls, the pundits, they thought, how could he have won? I don't know anybody who voted for him in Pauline Kale fashion. But they had, these people had turned, tuned out. But they did not, they tuned in when it was election time. And that was what was a big, tsunami. Nobody thought that they existed. Well, I think what's happened is that um, beltway politics, and I mean that in the largest sense of the bureaucracies, the people who staff federal offices, and the media, and the, the academic world, while they have very small numbers of, in terms of the percentage of the population, they have enormous cultural influence. And when they fixate on an issue, uh, transgender restrooms are a civil rights issue. Global warming is occurring, it's caused by man, it can be redressed by radical changes in the capitalist system. When they get these orthodoxies, Black Lives Matter because, uh, exists because there's an epidemic of black shooting innocent, I mean police shooting innocent black youth, and you can't question those, and they create a climate of fear that anybody does, and, and they fixated on Donald Trump, then people said, I don't believe this, but I understand that if I were to voice something, uh, I, it's almost like being in Salem, Massachusetts, and saying, I don't believe that she's a witch, but if I say anything, they might go after me. So you just keep quiet. But this time, it wasn't 25% or 30% of the country that kept quiet. It was half the country, and they took their revenge out at the polls. And I think there's going to be more people because if, if Trump were to achieve 3% economic growth or stabilize the world abroad or make changes in the tax code that encouraged entrepreneurship, then he would make identity politics secondary, not essential to a person's character. And basically, Trump's message, to the degree you can cipher it, is, I don't really care what color you are, I don't care what gender, I want to make you rich like me. And if we are all doing much better, then we don't have time to bicker about how our appearance appears or seems. So it's a, I think it, in a weird way it's an it's a argument of unity and not diversity in the sense of dividing people.
So how is the erosion of self-government and the evisceration of constitutional government at the heart of what the left is trying to do in America? Well, I think the left understands that if they were to put their cards out on the table and say, we believe in a huge deep state, administrative bureaucratic state that's not, that's run by elite experts, people don't want to buy into that. We know where that leads. At, at best, it leads to Venezuela or Cuba. And at worst, it leads to something like the former Soviet Union. So they can't tell us that. So almost everything that Obama did, the Benghazi mess, the Bo Bergdahl swap, uh, the Iran deal, we were learning about uh, some of the economic, there was always a second, a second story, a backstory to them that he could not be transparent about because uh, the left believes that because they believe in fraternity, equality, egalitarianism, fairness, and the right believes in liberty and individualism, that therefore they're more noble and that any means necessary are justified in obtaining them. And that means that if Obama wanted to spy on the AP reporters or deal with the IRS in a nefarious way or change the NSA to be a political instrument, it was okay because everybody thought, well, at least the progressives thought, the aim is to make us all equal, and that's noble. So uh, that's the pro problem with the progressive project. It, it's against human nature, and it doesn't understand the nature of people, which is unchanging since antiquity, and, and they don't have a message that is popular, so they have to be deceptive about it. The left is trying to make Donald Trump into a Nazi, that he's a totalitarian. So in order to justify anything that they do against him, um, they make him into Hitler. So how do you break through someone's mindset that believes that, Dr. Hansen? It's very hard because if you ask the people who say that Trump is a fascist or a Hitler, young people a lot, they don't know who Hitler was. They have no idea of the extent of the genocide. They have no idea who, what fascism was under Mussolini. And so they just use these terms and they throw them out and they see what sticks. So you're dealing with largely uneducated and ignorant people who are arrogant. It's a fatal combination. And uh, again, the idea is if you just say all, and notice how the Democratic Party is driven by the media, not vice versa. So if Bill Maher or Colbert uses a profanity or an obscenity, then people, whether it's a senator from New York or the head, of, they use it. If they feel that uh, having a transgendered restroom is an issue in Hollywood, then they adopt it. And it's, it's very strange that you don't have people in the legislatures or the Democratic think tanks coming up with policies on taxes or housing or labor or foreign policy that drive the, the discussion. It's almost as if this paralyzed, fragmented Democratic Party says, what does Hollywood think? What does Silicon Valley think? What does Wall Street think? What do celebrities think? And then we're going to follow them. And so the, they have a lot more influence in a weird way uh, because of television and movies and the universities that then their numbers would reflect. But uh, it's, it's an old argument that if you call somebody these, these terrible names, then you're, you'll settle or split the difference. So you get an argument with somebody and he'll say, Trump is a fascist, he's a Nazi. And you say, no, he's not. Well, don't you at least concede that he's a dictator? And then you say, okay, I'll just stop. The he's a dictator. And then you've said he's a dictator. So by doing this paranoid style, uh, they, they, they're, they're so over the top that they want to s settle for 55% of the difference, which leaves Trump as pretty awful. So uh, I think the thing that they're most sensitive to is the argument that you're very ignorant, your history, because the left always feels they're culturally superior. But if you really don't know how Hitler came to power, you don't know how Mussolini, you don't understand what happened in Japan in the 1930s, so you don't know what fascism is. There was a reason that the National Socialist Party had the word socialist in it, and they need to, to realize that there were elements of national socialism that included things like vegetarianism, radical environmentalism, radical labor uh, agitation that they don't talk about. But uh, if there is a fascist movement, and I think, I'm not sure there is, but if there is to be a fascist movement, it's, it's comprised of screaming down people on university campuses, blackballing speakers at graduation, 
disrupting public assemblies, getting on the internet and using profanities and trying to troll people, and being on television and, and adopting a profanity as sort of a normal vocabulary to excite people. That's, that's the road to fascism. And I remember one guy told me, he was chairman of La Raza Studies Program. He said, Victor, I make 95000 a year Cal State Fresno. He said, my cousin works for Equal Opportunity Program in a rural, my other sister works for a rural health thing. And what you are saying is that all this stuff causes more problems. And I can't accept that. That would destroy our careers. So I think we got to remember there's thousands of people are invested in this industry. And it's not easy to tell people you're doing more damage than good. Talk about what's going on on college campuses and the fact that Western civilization, ancient history, even free speech are out, yeah. and political correctness, multiculturalism, and almost an infantilism yeah. is going on. Explain what's happening culturally on yeah. campuses. That's a good question, culturally, because there's, I think there's two or three phenomena that we see. One is this idea that with reduced family size and greater affluence among our elite, we've, I mean, a globalized economy, people have money and opportunities they've never had, that we've got these helicopter parents and they've said to their children, you're going to go to pre-Stanford kindergarten or you're going to go to Harvard prep grad and we're going to get you and you're going to be like, just like a cow. We're going to brand you with the Amherst BA, the LLB, the JD, and then you're going to have a wonderful life in the coastal corridor. And so everything is going to go your way. And so we've deprived these children of muscular labor, that sense of tragedy in the world. And we put them on these campuses and anything they don't like becomes traumatic and then requires wealthy people to adjust to it. You have to have a safe space. You have to have a trigger warning. You can't be told your Halloween costume is too provocative. And they're like kindergartens. They're absolutely ill prepared to enter the real world. We've completely deprecated the value and noble notion of muscular labor. No parent, none of these kids know how to do, run a chainsaw or mow the lawn. They wouldn't want to. And so this metrosexual culture of self-indulgence and self-referent is not good. And the second thing that's happened is under the tenets of affirmative action, we had it backwards. We should have said we have new students coming in to the educational system both from immigration and from legacy of civil rights. So we're going to prepare them to be more competitive than the majority as, as redress. And that would mean from kindergarten, we're going to have Latin programs. We're going to have English diction. We're going to have English grammar. We're going to make them memorize the great poets. We're going to make sure that minority and underprivileged kids have the basic tools. Instead, we said, you're the victims of a racist culture. Entrust your education to all of our elitists, and we're going to give you therapy. So then we put the kids on campus, and they're competing uh, in Latinos, blacks, uh, other underrepresented people of the past are competing with highly motivated, highly privileged Asian and white students. And they obviously feel that uh, they're either not competitive in some cases or they've been steered to sociology or studies courses that don't give them the tools to succeed. And out of that frustration, they turn to, I'm a victim, I need special redress, I have to have a space, a theme house, I have to live or work with people who look like I do. And it reinforces that sense of, of uh, lack of confidence. And so the only way that we can give confidence to students of non-traditional is make sure that we give them the tool. I'm speaking to somebody who's taught 21 years classical languages to minority youth. And I can tell you that when I, I think I had, I sent 50 people to Ivy League law, law schools over 20 years and professional schools. And usually I made it, I tried to ensure that a student who was here illegally from Mexico that was in my class and after four years could speak English and know Latin better than a person of any background. And I never had to worry about self-confidence. I never, none of those students ever said they were members of La Raza because they had so much confidence in their abilities. And yet we really shortchanged this generation. And then the final irony is that a, a very wealthy liberal elite who does uh, obviously enjoy white privilege, 
felt guilty about that. So they virtue signaled to everybody the uh, dangers of white privilege, and they blamed people in the Midwest or the white working classes who never had white privilege. People in Bakersfield or Appalachia don't have any advantage about being white. They're, po they're very poor. Their, their longevity is even less than some minorities. And yet we castigated them and said, you've got white privilege, even though I have it. It's basically people who had it said somebody else had it as a way of expa expiating their own guilt. And so uh, you add all of that together with a system that $1 trillion in collective student debt and an administrative class that's grown three times the rate of the faculty, and it's an unsustainable proposition. I think it's going to implode. We're already seeing the university implode.